Context, the historical context. After Krishna left 5,000 years ago, how was the current of bhakti maintained? Where was it flowing? It was held in the hands of the Alvars initially, straight after Krishna departed. There were 12 Alvars, considered men who were immersed in deep contemplation of God. Of Krishna. So they were very 
Kula Shekha is one personality, Bhakti Sama is another personality, many, twelve of them. So they maintain the current of Bhakti and then Buddha Avatar manifested about three and a half thousand years ago from this point. Buddha Avatar. And then um, after Buddha Avatar, whose principal purpose was to distract the populace from following the Vedas. Actually, the Vedas were pushed out of India because of the advent of Buddha Avatar. He was, because so many discrepancies were being performed with the excuse of following Vedic Yajna. They had started to actually eat flesh when in Kali Yuga, after Krishna departs, it's Kali Yuga. So they had started to compromise their principles and they were taking flesh and they were making it sound bona fide according to the Vedic injunctions. Therefore, Lord Buddha, he pushed those Vedic teachings actually into Thailand, Vietnam, up there like that. And his principal message was Ahimsa, non-violence, and live a proper life, a noble life, a good life, because Kali was deteriorating, so these background things had to be maintained. So this was the first Buddha, Buddha Avatar. He was took his birth in Gaia. And now there's a second Buddha who is called Sakya Singha Buddha. And he appeared about 1500 years later. And he appeared in Nepal, in Kapil Ashram. And he came to Gaia for his apparent enlightenment. But he is a Mayavad Buddha. He was delivering only Mayavad conceptions. Just after him came Sankaracharya. Sankaracharya is none other than Lord Shiva, who was requested by Krishna to come and preach Mayavadism. But bring the Vedic teachings back into India. So he preached very similar. They call it a covered form of Buddhism. Basically is what Sankaracharya preached. Even though Sankaracharya is the greatest Vaishnava, nevertheless he was requested by Krishna to perform this rather onus task. Of course, we know at the end of his life, he was saying, Bhajay Govinda, Bhajay Govinda, Bhajay Govinda, just chant Govinda, chant Govinda, like that. But during his manifest pastimes, he was very much um, supporting this, we are one. And this philosophy of oneness is called what? Advaita, yes, Advaita. Dvaita is two, Advaita means one. So he was speaking this philosophy. This was 800 AD, was when Sankaracharya was present on the planet. Now, this is where we come to our historical um, birth of the Sampradayas. The Sampradayas were necessary. Sampradaya means school of thought, basically. It's a school of thought, unless we're in a specific sampradaya, our foundation is very weak, in fact. It's like Lord Jesus, which sampradaya was he in? It's questionable. There's not a strong indication of that. So the historic aspect is like who is his guru, who is his guru's guru, etc. Maybe John the Baptist is his guru. Then where is the line? Where is the dara? Where is the current coming from? It? It's describing that everything has to have authority, it has to have explanation. Where is it coming from, according to the Vedic conception? Because the Vedic is the only body of knowledge really in existence. This is the principle of it, not our body of knowledge. So there are four schools of thought, each blessed by a higher Ishtadeva or personality. There's the Sri Lakshmi 
Sampradaya. This is Ramanuja. And tomorrow is Ramanuja's disappearance. So we're getting a little bit round back this year, but we're honoring Madhvacharya today. And tomorrow we'll honor Ramanuja. But try to get this link between the different Sampradayas. They were all discussing who is God? Am I God? Are you God? Are we all God? Is there a difference between God? It, this was particularly the philosophy they were all rambling about. They were all discussing, arguing about. So Ram Anuja, the brother of Ram, very powerful personality. He appeared in 1017. And he was the first to challenge the Sankracharya philosophy. And he said, no, it's not one. There's a speciality in the oneness. This is called Vaishisht Advaita. I think in Hindi, Vaishisht also is there. It's a Hindi word. They're coming from Hindi. Vaishisht. Vishisht. Vishisht means speciality. So Ramanuja, he was saying, no, no, there's a speciality between Krishna and the Jiva. This was the first conception after Sankracharya, after Sakasena Buddha, after Buddha Avatar. This is the first conception for about 3,000 years where someone is actually standing up and saying, no, they're not God. So Ramanuja was a very powerful personality. He was expressing this under the potency of Sri Lakshmi Devi. And then, a hundred years later, in 1238, the great Madhvacharya appeared. And he was saying, no, it's not just a speciality. There's an absolute distinction between the Jiva and Krishna. So this is called the Vaita. This is called two. This is why he has this sign, two, two. And this is what he preached vigorously throughout India. When he was born, he took sannyas at 12 years old or 16 years old, very, very young. And he took from his Mayavad guru, Achuta Peksha. Peksha. Achuta Paksha. Or Preksha. And this was a Mayavad guru. And um, as I've said, Madhvacharya was extremely physically strong. Hanuman, Bhima, and Vayu. And he argued with his Mayavad guru and left in disgust that his Mayavad guru was complaining and was saying that it was all one. So he left and he traveled extensively around India. And he traveled establishing the principle of worship of Krishna. And then he even went to the Himalaya and he visited Vyasadeva there. And he spent time with Vyasadeva in the Himalayas. And he was inspired by Vyasadeva to write a commentary on Gita called Gita Basya. So this was his first commentary. And it's described, it was quite um, rough in the sense that it wasn't coated with lots of ornaments and so on. His nature was very direct, very pragmatic, like that. That was the nature of Madhavacharya. So his Basya also had that same kind of flavor. He also wrote the Brihat Bhagavatam Basya. These two books, he wrote his commentary on these two books. Interestingly enough, when he wrote his commentary on the 10th canto, he because Lord Brahma is our um, Adi Guru, he wouldn't write the pastime about Lord Brahma stealing the cows and cows. He just left that chapter out completely because he didn't want to put any sort of slight at all on Lord Brahma. It's very beautiful, it's very personal how he decided not to write any commentary. So if we look at any of the Madhvacharya commentaries of Bhagavatam, there's no, I think it's chapter 14, there's no chapter 14 in his commentary, he's just left it out completely. So it shows his strength of personality and his nishta, just by that one act alone. So Madhvacharya is establishing Dvaita philosophy. 
And then following Madhavacharya comes Balava Acharya, who is propounding Shud Advaita. Just a second. Balava Acharya. Nimbaditya is called Vishnu Swami. Sorry, what did I say? Balava. Vishnu Swami. Sorry, Vishnu Swami. So, Balava Acharya was in the Vishnu Swami line. He's the, one of the, he's the Acharya for the Vishnu Swami line. And the Easter day is the Rudra, Lord Shiva himself, in this third Sankaraya. Adi Guru, yes. And um, he was propounding the path of Rag Marg at this point. And then Nimbaditya comes after um, Vishnu Swami and he is um, I understand and we should Dvaita Dvaita. This is Nimbaditya. Duality, oneness within the duality. Duality within the oneness. I'm not much of a scholar, so these kind of terms. And Vishnu Swami, which one was he? Vishnu Swami was Shud Advaita. But the principle what I'm coming to is how Chaitanya Mahaprabhu reconciles these four currents of bhakti, these four sampradayas. These four sampradayas basically are dealing with the conception of who, who is God, the jiva or Krishna. This is what they're all dealing with. Ultimately, this is the ultimate philosophy. It's like Madhavacharya, for example, we were hearing from Bhagavad Maharaj last night, yesterday, about the five principles of Madhavacharya's philosophy. The relationship between Krishna and the Jiva, the Jiva and the Jiva, the Jiva and the material energy, Krishna and the material energy, and Jiva and the material energy. Krishna and Jiva, Krishna and Maya, Krishna, Jiva and Jiva, Jiva, Jiva and Jiva, that's one. Jiva and Jiva, yes, yes. You all know me, all these things, but by your mercy, I'm speaking these things on but I'm trying to give you a picture of the collective overview. If you get the overview, then you understand the purpose of these sampradayas and where they're actually all leading to. Because where they're leading to is a glorification of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Because when he comes, he reconciles all these differences in his sublime philosophy of Achintya, Veda, Abhinaya, Tattva. This Achintya means inconceivable. Veda means difference. Abheda means non-different. So the Jiva and Krishna are simultaneously one and different. This is the principle that they had all been, you know, arguing about. But coming back specifically to Madhavacharya, who we are glorifying today, and his personality and nature, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu wanted to, um, he has to come in one Sampradaya. So Mahaprabhu decided to come in this Madhava Sampradaya because of Madhava's powerful establishment of the deity and the defeat of Mayavadism. These are the two teachings that he took from Madhavacharya. Madhavacharya, uh, Mahaprabhu took two teachings from each of the Sampradayas. From Ramanuja, he takes service to the Vaishnavas. This is one great quality in the Ramanuja sect, is their service to Vaishnavas. And secondly, in the Ramanuja sect is pure bhakti, Shura bhakti. So he took these two teachings from Ramanuja. And then from Madhavacharya, he takes the establish, establishing of the Murti form. But remember that the Murti form, the deity form, was established by Prajnapa 5,000 years ago. But it had become very much lost due to the teachings of Buddha, the two different Buddhas, and Sankaracharya. The whole country was soaked in Mayavad impersonalism. This is what even today, 
there's such a still an influence of Sankaracharya. So these personalities were tremendously powerful because they pushed that negative or that impersonal conception back and they were replacing it with the personal conception. Specifically with Madhvacharya, the establishment of deity, deities. There was a time when Madhvacharya was sitting on the beach near Udupi and there was one boat by one wealthy merchant who was heading to Dwarka carrying Gopi Chanda, Tila. And at that time, that boat got stuck on a sandbank. And the um, captain knew that Madhvacharya was very strong. He asked, can you please help us all push the boat off? He told them all, stand back, I'll just do it myself. And he took the rope and he pulled that whole boat off the sandbank just by himself. And the captain was so impressed, he gave him a large piece of Gopi Chandan. And as they were bringing this Gopi Chandan to him, it dropped and broke. And inside that Gopi Chandan was a Bal Krishna Murti, holding a stick and a piece of food in his hand, a piece of a morsel of yogurt in his hand. A Bal Krishna, Gopal Krishna, small baby Krishna. Uh, Manavachari was a very heavy deity, but he carried this for seven miles back to Udupi and he established worship of Bala Gopal. So he established his worship in his four principal temples throughout India. And he um, inspired eight sannyasis to look after those four temples to carry on that line. But his principal contribution was to smash Mayavadism. This, was, this is what he gave his entire life for, to breaking that um, enemy of devotion, of theism, this Mayavad conception. So he did that by um, putting many, many deities, many murtis in place all across India. Wherever he was, he would establish a deity for worship to give the personal conception again. So this is the contribution of Madhavacharya. Simultaneously, he wrote these wonderful vasyas on the Bhagavatam and on Gita also. So this is, um, in a nutshell, very briefly, a description of the, the greatness. He also introduced fasting on a Kadashi, which actually wasn't done previously to Madhavacharya. So many wonderful things that he established. So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, he takes shelter of this Sampradaya. But of the other Sampradayas also, he takes two teachings from uh, Vishnu Swami, from the Rudra Sampradaya, he takes the worship of Krishna in Radha It wasn't Radha and Krishna, it was just Krishna. But Krishna, that spontaneous worship of just Krishna. And he took, um, the other one was um, the path of Radha and the path of Krishna. These, these two aspects he took, worship of Krishna. And then in Nimbaditya, they, um, their philosophy is taking shelter of Sri Radha. So Mahaprabhu also took this and understanding the highest place of Gopi Bhav. This is in the Nimbaditya Sampradaya. These two teachings are there. So this is what Mahaprabhu took. So this is like an overview. What we see coming historically from 5,000 years ago through the Alvars through Buddha Avatar, through Sakya Singha Buddha, through Sankaracharya, and then the four Sampradayas, Ramanuja, Madhavacharya, Vishnu Swami, and Nimbaditya. And what is their uh, purpose ultimately is to glorify Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Because Chaitanya Mahaprabhu came and he reconciled these differences. In the Sampradayas also, they supported the philosophy called Vastu Parinamvad. Vastu means an object, it means Krishna. They were saying that Krishna transforms into the material world and elements. It's Vastu Parinamvad. Krishna is the object and he's transforming. But Mahaprabhu said, no, all of this is actually wrong. It's Shakti Parinamvad. It's Krishna's energies that are transforming into this material world, not himself. It's not Krishna himself that is transforming, but it's Krishna's energies 
So it's called a Shakti Parinama. But they had it all wrong. They were all no, proclaiming. Mostly Sankaracharya was coming. But also Madhavacharya and all the other Sankaracharya? Yes, so not clear it was there. They tried to. But, Yes, again, they were sort of like the scholars were kind of putting their heads into it, and, you know, but basically Mahaprabhu, he emphatically um, revealed that this Shakti Parinamba is the principle. So try to just appreciate the um, nature of Madhavacharya and where he comes in historically into our life in connection with Mahaprabhu. Everything is supportive of Mahaprabhu. When Mahaprabhu went to Udupi, and it's described, he argued with the Tattvavadis. But it wasn't arguing with the philosophy of Madhavacharya. The Tattvavadis had become, um, what do you call, uh, compromised in their principles, and they were taking karma and jnana, and they were actually taking for themselves. They had distorted the philosophy of Madhavacharya. So Mahaprabhu, he straightens that out. He teaches them and describes in that pastime then. So this is something that we are very brief because we want to go into another topic. But this is something of Madhavacharya. We should be very grateful today for Madhavacharya, for his establishment of the Sampradaya, Dara, for Lord Brahma. Of course, he's the Adi Guru of our Sampradaya. So get that picture. Actually, I just made a little book. I didn't bring it with me, but it's um, it's about the Navadri Parikrama, and all of those reasons are enumerated there very clearly, so you can see that later. Another side of during this Mahotsav in Gopinath Bhavan in Vrindavan, one lady she gave to the sannyasis who were invited. She never gave book about for some details. Obviously, only in Hindi available now. So I have requested the publishing team to put on a project of translating that book into English and I think we all should support that in some way because it's very interesting. The first time I saw I didn't know of the existence of this book. I knew that Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur had written one. I think I got this now. We also do have a book already in English about the four Sampradayas. Sampradayas. This is compiled by a devotee in ISKCON that has taken all of the different um, descriptions of the four Sampradayas and he's described extensively Madhavacharya's philosophy, extensively Ramanuja's philosophy, extensively Vishnu Swami, and extensively Nimbaditya. And I can send it to you straight away, I actually have it on the front the But it's a, it's a very valuable book to have as a a background policing because these four sampradayas are very important to appreciate where do we slot in and then like today our appreciation of where is Mahavacharya in this dara, this current of Bhakti, where does that come in? Mother continue, is this translation already started? Yeah, Anita was sure, so there's somebody on the project already. Three chapters already done? Oh, okay. It's in process. So, don't play around there. Madhavacharya ki jai. This is um, a little bit distance from Braj. But we want to come back to the um, exclusive sweetness of Braj. This is really what this presentation is about to try to inspire us towards an appreciation of the absolute sweetness of Raj. So yesterday, Krishna was attacked by Bhutana, the demon. And just with his little lips, he drank her light air and killed her. It wasn't Krishna, of course. Krishna was just stuck in her mouth. But the Vishnu or the Shakti within Krishna killed Putana. It's not Rajendrananda. Bhagavad Maharaj again was describing this yesterday. Of Shamsundra, Dwakadish, Mathuraj, Mahatma all in one form. Krishna. 
So in Vrindavan, three months later, Krishna is described, managed to turn himself over. This is remarkable. We're talking about that Supreme Person. But when we actually dive into Brajavila, it no longer becomes that Supreme Person. It becomes that most sweet, beautiful lover of the gopis or the Brijabhasis. This is the mood that changes. Buddha used to say so many times, your Swamiji, Swami has described that Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. But I have come to tell you that he actually is not. So these two conceptions are there. So now, this Shakatasura pastime, the Kart pastime, and at this point, Srila Vishnu Chakrabarti Thakur, he describes that even though we may have heard these pastimes so many times before, because of their eternal nature, they're always going on in some planetary system. Um, they're totally nourishing for our bhakti to hear again and again and again the same pastimes. So the devotee never tires of hearing these Vrindavan pastimes. So Krishna managed to turn over and in Vedic culture they have these samskar festivals or ceremonies for practically everything the child does when he gets his first teeth, when he rolls over, um, his hair cutting ceremony. When he gets his car. He gets his car, whatever. He gets all these different, and there's a, there's a ceremony for it. Vedic culture is most beautiful and sublime because everything is connected to the Supreme. Nothing is separate from Krishna. Nothing in existence is separate from Krishna. This is the ultimate philosophy, actually. But in Braj, it's connected in such a loving, special, personal way. And hearing these personal pastimes smashes our impersonal conceptions just by hearing the pastimes. This is why Srila Gurudev would repeatedly have a speak these different pastimes describing sweet baby Krishna in Braj. So this festival called the Uttana um, Mahotsav and many many Brahmins were gathered and so many beautiful prayers were being sung and chanted and Mother Yashoda was very, very busy attending to all the guests and so on. And Vedi Krishna was very satisfied. And then um, at one point, Mother Yashoda, she wanted to, she had to become more involved in the festivities. This festival, Jiva Goswami describes, lasted four and a half hours. This festival of celebrating Krishna turning over. This is how much they love Krishna. They were ready to give four and a half hours worth of festivity because he turned over. This is a mood of their dedication to him. Just prior to this, of course, as I was describing yesterday, Krishna was um, demanding that all the elder gopis hold him. Because each time when he would start to cry, then another gopi would come and take him. Then Krishna would stop. And then he'd start to whimper again, they'd give to another. And then he'd stay for a while, then he'd whimper again, then they'd give to him. They'd pass Krishna around, constantly, practically day all day. He was being passed around from Gobi to Gobi to Gobi. And, as I described yesterday, it's, it's saying in the Rana Ganesh um, Deepika, that all the um, Brijabhasis, practically speaking, were related directly to Krishna. They were all his first cousin, second cousin, third cousin, etc. They're all directly, so they're all Krishna's relatives. So they all have to come and see baby Krishna every day. It's their duty to come and see Krishna every day. Uncle. Huh? Uncle. Uncle and uh, Uncle and aunties. So many uncles and aunties. Yes. Aunties. So during this festival, when Mother Yashoda realized that she had too much um, service to attend to, then she very carefully put Krishna down in a beautiful place underneath a um, cart and on the cart were many golden and silver pots etc. Very heavy, strong cart. And she put him on a mattress beautifully to take rest and Krishna was sleeping nicely. And there were other little children around there guarding Krishna. And then Mother Yashoda, she went away to attend to her different duties in 
uh, serving all the Brahmins and the Brahmanis, all the wives of the Brahmins who had come to this festival. And during this time, a demon called Shakata Sura, Shakata means cart demon. This cart demon had seen the um, death of Putana and he wanted to avenge the death of Putana. So he came and he thought, I want to take a body. If I take a body, maybe this little boy will now have to kill me. I, I'll just take like an air body, like a ghost body, so to speak. So that ghost body enters the cart where Krishna is lying underneath and starts to make it very, very, very heavy. And then this cart starts to sink into the ground to crush baby Krishna. This was his intention. And then Krishna, of course, is realizing this. But prior to this, Krishna had been crying for his mother. And his mother was so caught up in the commotion of what was taking place during the festival that she neglected to hear Krishna's cries. And Krishna was crying louder and louder and louder. And then finally, in conjunction with Krishna wanting his mother, this demon was manifesting, making the cart sink deeper and deeper. So Krishna saw this as a good opportunity to get attention from his mother simultaneously as actually chastise and kill this demon. But again, it wasn't Krishna. It was that Vishnu aspect or the Sahara Shakti residing within Krishna that is going to kill this demon. And then Krishna, with his very small, tiny, little lotus feet, which were described as being soft as leaves, or as soft as petals, he just raised his feet, and with the raising of his feet was sufficient to smash the cart to pieces, to break the cart completely into pieces. And then there was a tremendous commotion when the cart fell over and all the pots and pans and everything that had been on the cart scattered and made a huge amount of noise. And everyone came running and they quickly picked up Krishna. Mother Yashoda quickly picked up Krishna. And they were just amazed that he'd managed to survive. Not even a hair on his body was actually touched by this disaster, this accident. And then Nanda Baba immediately came. Prior to this, Nanda Baba hadn't been so present because this was mostly the ladies who were performing this ceremony. But as soon as the sound of this commotion, this cart breaking, then Nanda Baba and the elder gopis immediately came. Gopas immediately came. And then they saw to Krishna, he was fine. And then they were so bewildered, how has this happened? And they asked the children who were standing around, the children in their broken language, they were describing actually Krishna, he just put his feet on the top of the cart and the cart broke. And the uh, gopas, they were thinking, no, this can't be like that. How is it possible that such a strong, solid cart that we've had for so many years can suddenly break just because the soft, sweet lotus feet of Krishna are touching that cart that it should break? So they disbelieved them, actually. They couldn't understand. But Mother Yashoda was very, very concerned because she was very worried, thinking um, that Putana has already come to try to kill her lover. And she was often thinking that even Lord Shiva would think that Krishna was so beautiful, he'd want to take him as a jewel and put him in his hair. She was thinking that Krishna was so beautiful. So Mother Yashoda was always a little bit afraid that someone was going to steal Krishna. But Jiva Goswami says, actually, she had no need to fear because Krishna would steal the heart of any thief who came to steal him. Krishna was so beautiful, he would steal their heart and become so attracted to the thief that the thief would just leave him there alone. So Jiva Goswami describes like that. So when they um, pacified Krishna, Mother Yashoda gave him illness, and then the stronger men under the direction again of Upananda and Abhinanda, they reassembled that cart and put all the pots and pans back on the cart. And then they went back to their ceremony with great vigor. Now, because actually it appeared that Krishna had almost had the possibility of losing his life or at least becoming very much involved by such a catastrophe. So again, they were deeply taking shelter of Lord Narayana. Understanding Braj, 
Even today, the bridge Vasis, they take shelter on Lord Narayan. Krishna is their friend. Krishna is their most beloved Lala. It's not someone that they, they run to when they're in trouble as much as they think of Lord Narayan. They actually think that Lord Narayan, Nanda Baba, he's worshipping the Shalagram. He's worshipping Lord Narayan. This is Nanda Baba's worship. But he's being told by Gaga Muni that actually your son is like Narayan. Your son is like Lord Narayan. So they have these two different conceptions. Krishna they spontaneously are just attracted to. And they realize his remarkable power as he goes through these different pastimes. But the principal power that they experience from Krishna is his amazing affection that he appears to have for all of them. They have the feeling that Krishna is fully dependent on our love for him. They are thinking this all the time. That Krishna, without me holding Krishna, without me giving him a ladder, without me playing with him, then Krishna is going to become so unhappy. Krishna is not going to be satisfied. So this mood that the gopis have, that Krishna is actually dependent on us. They also appeal to Krishna at many times, like Govardhan Hill, Kali and Nada, etc. But still, at the same time, they are thinking fully that Krishna is dependent on us. This is the mood of the Prajvasa. It is very, very beautiful. So, this pastime um, took place when Krishna was just three months old. And as I described yesterday, Krishna is showing the power of his lotus feet. Yesterday was the power of his lotus lips. And tomorrow it's going to be, or even today actually, we've probably got time to get Trinavrata. So, um, his Trinavrata is his hand. So this demon, I'll just read you what Bhakti has written. He represents load-carrying mentality out of old and new habits. We're carrying these old and new habits into our practicing of bhakti. This is what this demon represents, an anartha. And it's described that um, it creates a dullness and a lethargy in the sadhak. This dullness and lethargy is created by to previous negative habits we carry through. And Krishna removes this by kicking it aside. But simultaneously, the devotee has to make his effort to kick this aside. We understand there are two aspects to Krishna. There is my effort, which is called chesta, and then there is Krishna's mercy. So we have these two aspects, like the two fingers that bind Krishna, too short, in the Dhammadar Lila. We'll discuss that. So we have to make our efforts simultaneously. Krishna is not just going to take this away without our effort and our understanding of what it is to take away. We have to be knowledgeable of that. And then it's described in the Gaga Samhita that um, Shakatasura had this body made of air. And in his previous birth, he was a son of Hiranyaksha the brother of Hirani Kashipu. And his name was Utkacha. Utkacha was his name. And he went to the hermitage of Lomasa Muni. And he broke some trees and was cursed to become bodiless. Because previously he had a huge body. But then he fell at the Muni's feet and begged for mercy. And then the Muni said that in the next Manvantara, you will be delivered by the Lord. There are 14 Mandantaras in the day of Lord Brahma. And in the next Mandantara, he will be delivered by the Lord. <clears throat> so, one day of Brahma, there are 14. 14 Manus in one day of Lord Brahma. And in each Manu, there are 71 cycles of 
four yugas. Satcha, Treta, Dwarpa, Kali. Satcha, Treta, Dwarpa, Kali. Satcha, Treta, Dwarpa, Kali. Times 14 is called a Divya Yuga or a Chatur Yuga. And there are four of those. Uh, and there are 71 of those Chatur Yugas in one Manvantara. So one Manvantara is a great length of time. And there are 14 Manvantaras in one day of Lord Brahma. One day of Lord Brahma, you should write this down, is 4 billion, 320 million years is just one day of Lord Brahma. And then it's divided into these 14 Manus. So now we are in the seventh Manu, the seventh Manvantara. And this seventh Manvantara is when Krishna appears and straight after Chaitanya Mahaprabhu appears. So this is the rarity of Prajendrananda Shamsundra's appearance. In all the other Manvantaras, Krishna appears so many times like the waves of the ocean, but never as Prajendrananda in Krishna, never as this Krishna that we're hearing about today. Hearing about these topics is incredibly confidential, actually. This is a prelude, these childhood topics, this Balya uh, and Lila, is a prelude to Krishna's remarkable pastimes with the gopis, which ultimately is the Satyam Paramadimahi, which ultimately is the goal of our life to become absorbed in. This is like a prelude, a very simple step by step going through Krishna's childhood pastimes. It brings us to the Vainuvi and the Gopigi, Pranayaki, the Nidalki, the etc. These um, are the very special parts of Bhagavatam. But this is an introduction, these childhood pastimes. So again, that shows something of this historical context. Knowing the historical context, like we just described about Bhagavacharya, gives us a broader picture of time, the time frame, how we are in these bodies for so much time, what is and how the first symptom of Bhav, in fact, is not to waste any of this time. Even though time may be so expansive, nevertheless, we need to utilize it in what is the most valuable aspect of our life, what is the most um, uh, useful um, way we can use our time. If you have any questions about Shaka Tassura, you can ask them now. So he, was, he was the son of Hiranyaksha in a previous Manvanta, in a previous Divya Yuga. Yes, 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 that's correct. The Shrinade appears in the fourth Manvantara. And he appears again in another Manvantara, in the Lagu Bhavanamrita. It's described the different appearances of all the different avatars. Like the Srinade, he appears five or six times in a day of Lord Brahma. Varaha also. There's Sweta Varaha and Shyam Varaha. There's different colors of Varaha. Varaha Dev's appearance will be in three or four days time. So the Shrinade Bhagavan doesn't appear in a day No. No, it's not like that. No, no. What? No. The question. He wants to know, he's asking, if the Srinade appears in every Divya Yuga. No, he doesn't appear in every Divya Yuga. There's a speciality, but actually, in a sense, he does because his pastimes are eternal and therefore they are always written down. Just like when we celebrate the Srinya Chakudasi here, it seems like, oh, he was just here yesterday. That's the impression we get. We're performing the Prahlad drama and it just seems like yesterday but Lord Nishringa, but actually he appeared millions of years ago. But because of the nature of the avatars are ever fresh, it appears in our consciousnesses that they are actually like just gone by in the previous Satya Yuga. 
but it's actually not like that. He, he is appearing in some other universe. Always he's appearing and disappearing. So in that sense, he's eternal. But also in our consciousnesses, he's eternal. I had this understanding the last Nishinga Chapter Dasi, that it just seemed like yesterday that Nishinga Day appeared. But actually, it's so. This is the nature of the avatars. The transform. So, in so, one sense, some avatars from every universe. All of these persons, I don't know some absolutely. I know something. And some avatars come every, like every single Kali Yuga. Kalki comes. And there are always Yuga avatars in Sakshi Yuga. There's about six or seven Yuga avatars, like Vaikuntana, um, uh, Paramatma, uh, Parameshwara, Yogeshwara. These are all avatars of Krishna. And all different avatars will come, like in Satya Yuga, because it's a very Aishwaryan yeah, atmosphere. One is Yuga, and one is Yuga. Yes, and there's always one principal Yuga avatar. And specifically, we should appreciate because so many people ask the question, why do you people say there's no Kalki avatar in this age? There are 999 ages when Kalki appears directly. But in this age, only Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is the Yuga avatar. And because Mahaprabhu is the sum and bonum of all avatars, Kalki is actually within him. So you can say, in a sense, that Kalki is appearing in the body of Mahaprabhu, but he doesn't actually appear and annihilate all the demons like it's described. It's a beautiful description, I'll just take a moment to say, that in every, um, at the end of each Kali Yuga, Kalki comes and he annihilates all those barbarians, all those dacoits, all those um, false kings, etc. And then it's described very beautifully that the fragrance from his lotus feet mixed with the tulsi leaves and sandal paste on his feet comes in the nostrils of the remaining brahmanas. And at that time, that fragrance transforms their consciousness into a mood of Satya Yuga. This is how Satya Yuga actually manifests after Kali Yuga. It's through fragrance, the fragrance of Kalki's lotus feet, the fragrance of Tulsi and sandal paste. That's how um, Satya Yuga manifests, and then gradually, gradually, the trees start growing bigger, the water becomes nicer, etc. Everything becomes purified, and then the advent of Satya Yuga. But in this age, I asked you a number of times actually, because it doesn't give an absolute specific answer like the description of Kali, but Gurudev just describes that Harina itself will um, annihilate those remaining demons and Harina himself will manifest the next Satya Yuga. That was the best answer. Maybe Padmanra, you heard something? Because I asked this question so many times to Gurudev. Well, how does such a yuga matter? Because this description is in the 11th canto, or maybe it's the 12th canto, 11th canto, of the appearance of Kalki, and this is of the appearance of such a yuga rather, from the fragrance of Kalki. But I was always curious, well, how does such a yuga manifest then um, without Kalki? Because the influence of Adina and Sankirtan. Yes. With yes. There is no inner spirit. I, 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 I have a difficult time reconciling that because we see the degradation of the age day by day by day. But also everyone gets benefited day by day, even though they degrade. But by hearing the sound vibration, that's why they will become benefited. But also, can you hear what Prajna is saying? No, it's too soft. We're discussing now for a few moments about the advent of Satya Yuga from Kali Yuga without the Kalki avatar. And Prajna Prabhu is describing how the potency of Harinam 
will spread through this age continuously. Its current of potency will be there by the power of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And even though it appears to be apparently degrading day by day, nevertheless, the benefit in store for all the populace, this is what I'm understanding, um, will be somehow or other benefited by that sound vibration, its presence on the planet. Somehow or other, actually Shiva Bhagavan Maharaj speaks this often that um, without the presence of a Mahabhagavan on the planet, basically Mother Earth would just sink into the Garden of Ocean. It's the Mahabhagavan and this Mahamantra has a similar um, effect in a sense that it's holding back the most wicked aspects. Although when you study the news or whatever, it seems like you can't get much more wicked. But it's going to get even more wicked. I know. So therefore, to appreciate what you're saying, I, it's hard for my intelligence to appreciate that. Obviously, it's a chintya, how Hari Nam is empowering. But certainly, Gurudev said directly to me, because I asked him the question specifically, he said that Hari Nam will be the connecting factor between Kali Yuga and Satya Yuga. Temporary yeah. yeah. At the end of the, of the Kali Yuga. Many times. The whole universe will be half filled with water. So on this planet, one thing is that the sound vibration travels throughout the universe. But the pure sound vibration of Sikhani Mahaprabhu manifesting here. I'm just telling something. I'll repeat it in a second. It's not so important. He's saying the sound vibration is traveling throughout the universe of this Mahamantra. And this is maintaining the earth from stopping to drop into the Dharma Dark Ocean. Yeah, when Krishna himself was present on this planet, he weighed the tsunami of Krishna fame flooded. Now that we have it surrounded, and now it is flooding the Western world, and it's one point that some misconception sometimes that devotees ask Gurudev a number of times, would have heard so many times, they're saying, oh, Prabhupada, he said there would be a 10,000 year um, respite, a golden age. And when is that going to happen? And I saw Gurudev look in the person's eyes and say, hasn't it already happened in your heart? It's the consciousness that is being affected. It's not necessarily the external aspect that is going to change at all. You will still get a degeneration of everything, of water, vegetation, everything, as we're seeing very clearly in front of us. It's all deteriorating and lower qualities are manifesting. Electronics are just taking people's minds, etc. But the, for the devotee, that golden age will certainly flourish in his consciousness by hearing these sweet pastimes of Krishna in Vrindavan, by chanting Hare Krishna, by associating with pure devotees, by chanting the Mahamantra, then our consciousnesses are going to become the same as a golden age. Because consciousness is the symptom of the soul. It's the symptom of life, in fact. Consciousness is the principle. So it's the consciousness that is going to alter, not the material gross aspects. This is how I've understood. Uh -huh. right. Well, um, one thing I do remember Shilad Gurudev specifically telling me is that... You can all hear? Is that in Kali Yuga, if it was not this Dhamya Kali Yuga, yes. like Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's actual appearance yeah. in the day of Brahma, right. All the other Kali Yugas are different than this one because in this one we see that there is so much advancement in technology within this last 500 years from the time of Mahaprabhu. And Gurudev said that this would not have taken place in Kali Yuga if Mahaprabhu had not appeared, it would be like the Dark Ages. Like, it would be like that. But because of Mahaprabhu's appearance on the planet, uh, at approximately exactly the same time when in Europe there was a renaissance. Yeah. And the entire world became more and more 
capable of understanding different aspects of mundane knowledge. Industrial revolution. Yeah, but not only that, but also spirituality was flourishing during the time that Mahaprabhu was on the planet. And it's significant how you just mentioned about uh, the fragrance from the lotus feet of Kalki, ushering in Satya Yuga and all that. We can just imagine, I mean, knowing who Mahaprabhu is, what kind of powerful effect that he had on the planet, the entire planet, whether they were on the other side of the planet or not. Everybody must have been feeling that auspicious divine inspiration and presence, and therefore it manifested like in the form of Renaissance. And then by the, by the saffron dust particles of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's lotus feet, Kali Yuga will transform into Satya Yuga. Yeah. Yeah, we can say like that. But the point is that even for, like Prabhupada says, 10,000 years, uh, he, would, he would make that point more than once. And <clears throat> it may be that there is a very powerful period, like Mahaprabhu said, Priti Vite Yachanagaradikra, that my name will be heard and known every single town and village on the earth planet. You know, Srila Bhakti Raksha, Srila Maharaj, he admitted one time that, you know, prior to our Prabhupada coming to the West and starting the movement all over the world, he said, we, we here, we started to think that maybe what Mahaprabhu was referring to was mainly India, every town and village in India. But then when Swami Maharaj did this incredible, miraculous accomplishment, then we understood, oh yes, everywhere. Every living being, you know, every living being. So Mahaprabhu, this Dhanya Kali Yuga is far, far, far superior to any other Kali Yuga. It can manifest externally and also, as you're saying, consciousness wise. And Guru Dev stressed that all he doesn't appear like his physical manifestation on the planet. That, but all the way to the end of Kali Yuga, this powerful effect of Mahaprabhu's presence. But also, if someone is arguing vehemently that Kalki must appear, yes, he appears in the body of Mahaprabhu. Because Mahaprabhu is the repository of all avatars. So, this is how it's reconciled. Yes, Mahaprabhu does appear. Because some scriptures maintain that Kalki appears in every single Kali Yuga. Yes, he appears. He appears in the body of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. This is very inspiring, I mean, personally, to glorify Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Basically, our description this morning of Madhavacharya was none other than a glorification of Mahaprabhu. Because all the Sampradayas support Mahaprabhu's action, reconciling the differences with Achintya Veda Veda Aveda Tattva. This is philosophy. And everything, we cannot understand, yesterday I was describing that Gurudev gives the Satyam Paramadimahi of all Bhagavatam as being Gauranga Mahaprabhu. So everything is under the shelter of Mahaprabhu. So it's very wonderful to... One more point I want to make. Um, in 1976, like a year, or actually it was the beginning of 1977, oh, sorry, not 1976, 77, just before Kalimad finished his pastime. So, uh, you know, one of his leaders was always giving a, a regular newsletter, BBT newsletter that would go around to all the temples. And we would eagerly get news of Prabhupada or whatever he was saying at that time. And I remember this astonishing statement that Prabhupada made at that time. He said, actually, uh, this Krishna consciousness movement is directly and indirectly affecting the whole world right now. And at that time, I thought, well, what is it doing indirectly? Because we saw directly how many people were coming to Bodhis during that time, and how powerful it was, and how millions and millions of books going out, and everything like that. But then he said, also indirectly. And then I came to understand over the last 15 years, from the time that Sri Prabhupada came, and the Bodhis talk about this a lot nowadays, look at the change in society, especially Western society how people have become so much open to understanding, you know, reincarnation, yoga, meditation, vegetarianism, all, you know, Eastern philosophy, everything like that. 
So we can see that actually, on a broad scale, the Krishna consciousness movement has actually already changed the consciousness of the people of the entire world. And it's only just begun, because Mahaprabhu was influenced in 500 years. Beautiful. Yeah, and only 50 years since Prabhupada came, you know. Five decades. And already, such a major change. So, you know, Srila Prabhupada did predict there would be cataclysms, even Srila Bhattacharaj, there would be two-thirds of the world's population would be destroyed, but then after that, it would be extremely favorable for preaching. So all these things are actually coming, because they're tree colored young. And more than one of them have told this fact. So major, major shifts and changes will happen. We don't know that within the next hundred years, within the next five hundred years, we can't really say. But we see the rapid advancement of communication technology. And it's being used powerfully by Kali, but it's also being used by Krishna. You know? And that's actually the reason why it was developed. Yeah. Mahaprabhu allowed this to be developed so that anybody anywhere on so the little smartphone can download all the Vedic knowledge. Yeah. You know? And watch the peer devotee speaking on video. Yeah. It's only happened within the last like 10 or 20 years, you know. We're talking about how in here, anyway, just going to put a plug in for Google here, that this morning I wanted to know more details about Sakya Singha Buddha, the exact dates and everything, so I just Googled it and it was right there. Normally you have to get work on it all to find this, it's like so much knowledge, as you, I was looking up the difference between the Pran Sakis and the Nitya Sakis the other day, just typing in on Google. So we have that information, which, you know, supports our life. I just want to say one more thing, linking with Madhavacharya from what you said, that Madhavacharya's last message to the world was, don't sit still, go forth and preach. And then he left in 1318. So that was his last words, don't sit still, go forth and preach. So, in line with what you just said, I thought that brings it together very nicely. She put up Sri Lamadavacharya Ijai, Sri Rajendrananda Sri Krishna, and Shakatasura pastime. Don't forget the pastimes also. We kind of like sandwich them in today, but the pastimes are the most important. When you're chanting, to meditate on these sweet pastimes. And you can read them again and again and again. And try to envisage being in brunch. Try to envisage the sweetest of these relations. Because this is the Satyam Paramadimai. This is the goal of our life. To connect with this desire to have this attraction to Krishna. This is the goal of our life. Shri Guru Dev Ki Jai, Arad Kodavashtana, 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 Arad Kodav